makes us free. We broadcast a message of truth, light, and love. With love we're covering unity. Nice. We glory in our unity, growth in body, spirit, and soul. To Christ. Wow. I miss my, you know what I did? Is I sang the unity melody.
And good to see some faces we haven't seen for a while. It's exciting to have you with us. I am Mary Gabrielson. I am your minister here. And it is always my joy to welcome you to celebrate the truth with us here at Unity Center. So let's begin our time together with our statement of faith. There's only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God, the good, omnipotence. Okay, we have a brand new congregational affirmation. And we're speaking this affirmation because we are going to be calling a new minister. And we want to bring out the very best of us collectively as a community. So we can do it kind of slow and easy, but let's do it together. We at the Unity Center are a loving, diverse, inclusive spiritual community who come together to demonstrate and live the teachings of Jesus Christ by listening, learning, and powering ourselves and others. Now, that was really good for our first whack, don't you think? That was great. This is the time of the celebration when we take prayer requests. We lift up those that you would like us to Hold in prayer. We ask that you give just the first name and the desired outcome that you are wanting us to pray with you. Yes, please. Peace to Uncle Bob's family. 
Okay. Yes. You're waiting for a tip. Answer Fran. Yes, please. Feelings of joy, gratitude for a preliminary result, and hope. Yes. Feelings of Carol's birthday. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. Feeling for Dennis and Jenny. Good. Sometimes I can see somebody's face and I can't remember their name, but I got it. Okay. Anything else that we want to? Look? Yes, please. Uh, well, prayers for my son um, that he is uh, happy with his future, uh, strong uh, patient, and that uh, he will find joy and peace. Okay. Please. Less than him, six, sure. I'm too snoopy. Where are you going? Okay. All right. Will you join me in prayer? As we come into this time together, we know the truth that God knows what we have need of even before we ask. And so as we are speaking these affirmative prayers, it has nothing to do with changing God's mind. It has everything to do with helping us to own the truth that we are speaking. And so we begin by blessing Uncle Bob's family in this time of crisis and passing of him. We hold the family in the light of God, knowing that God's peace and mercy fills each one. May they feel God's compassion so deeply that it enfolds them as if it is a warm hug. And Uncle Bob, we bless you on your way, knowing that you go forth to be welcomed home by God into God's great house of love. And for this, we give thanks. For those that are needing prayers for healing, Cheryl Ann, Denise, Eugene, Dick, Loretta, Fran, Dennis, Joy, and Jenny, and anyone else, Carol, and anyone else who needs prayers for healing, whether you've spoken the word or not, God knows what's in your heart. But for each one, we know the truth, that the life of God is fully present in every cell and atom of your being. Every system of your being is working smoothly under the wisdom and guidance of God that is also present in each cell and atom. We know that your bodies, your body temples, your minds, your hearts, your feeling nature, everything is being renewed, restored, revitalized, regenerated, and made whole, well, and free. And for this, we give thanks. We celebrate in great gratitude for the preliminary results of the first exam that um, our sister <clears throat> has accomplished so beautifully. And we say thank you, God, that you are with her in every word, every step of the way in the process. And we give thanks for the continuing success. The continuing success of, um, of our beloved. We 
affirm and celebrate a new roof for Unity Center, knowing that this is something that has been needed for more than 50 years. And it is coming to pass with ease and grace. And we say thank you. Thank you, God. For Aaron, we affirm a happy future. May you know joy, peace of mind, peace of heart, and what is yours to do. And for Russ and Lynn, we say thank you, God, for the safe travels that take them to their destination and to their returning home. All these things we pray in the name and the nature of the indwelling Christ presence. And so it is. Amen. I have asked Sandy to read the daily word today. Good morning. Sunday, November 21st, grace. Grace is my constant blessing. I discover grace all around me when I open my eyes, my mind, and my heart to its, to its presence. Grace reminds me that God's love is active everywhere and at every moment. Grace can be as quiet as a whisper. It's in the love I hear in the voice of someone dear and in the warmth and tenderness of a comforting touch. Grace is in heartfelt welcome I receive when invited into a friend's home. It's the bliss I feel when I know I truly belong. God is the heart of all grace, has goodness and kindness in action. Always mine to receive and give in kind. My growing awareness inspires me to share the activity of God generously by calling it into expression. And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. Acts 20, 32. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to be blessed now by music from the dynamic duo of... <laughs> of, um, sorry, I've got three things going on here. I can't do it all at once. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Julie, Julie and Doug, we're so happy to have you. And I had good fun with you when you were practicing before the service. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this is a song that I could never practice enough. You know what I mean? I could keep going practicing, but I really wanted to do it uh, because I happen to know that it's one that Mary loves. I've only done it. Yeah, I guess I've only done it once on the recording um, last year. I don't think I've done it live, um, but I've got my trusty friend here to cover any anything I need covered. So many things we can't control. So many hurts that happen every day. So many heartaches that pierce the soul. So much pain that won't ever go away. How do we make it better? How do we make it through? What do we do when there's nothing we can do? We can be kind. We can take care of each other. We can remember that deep down inside we all need the same thing. And maybe we'll find if we are there for each other that together we'll weather whatever tomorrow may bring. Nobody really wants to fight Nobody really wants to go to war. Everyone wants to make things right. So what are we always fighting for? Does nobody want to see it? Does nobody understand? The power to heal is right here in our hands. 
We can be kind. We can take care of each other. We can remember that deep down inside we all need the same thing. And maybe we'll find if we are there for each other that together we'll weather whatever tomorrow may bring. And it's not enough to talk about it, not enough to sing a song. We must walk the walk about it. You and I do a die. We gotta try to get along. We can be kind. We can take care of each other. We can remember that deep down inside we all need the same thing. And maybe we'll find. If we are there for each other, that together we'll weather whatever tomorrow may bring. And maybe we'll find true peace of mind if we always remember we can be. A sweet gift it is. Thank you so much. That is really one of my very, very most favorite songs. Cultivating stillness. So I want to jump back to what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. And I want to jump right in to the idea that cultivating stillness is really key. Stillness is key to our sense of well-being to our spiritual well-being, to our spiritual maturity and spiritual poise and confidence. So there are five practices that I want to touch on today. Now, I'm drawing things from several different books. One of my favorites is Eckhart Tolle's Stillness Speaks. It's not a new book, but it's certainly chock full of great info. And then the book you may be less familiar with, uh, Stillness is Key by Ryan Holiday. The first week that I spoke about this, I gave you kind of a potpourri of at least a dozen books on the topic of stillness. And why I was doing that is because there are so many books written and being written, and we are still buying them and reading them. So clearly, there's something important about this idea of stillness. And you, you got to say, well, why? Why is it important? It's important to our relationships, being able to be centered, to be still within and not getting hooked by stuff is really important. And it's important to us to have clarity in our thinking so that we can act constructively and effectively. So there are five practices, as I said, and I want to share with you. The first is this to remember that there is a link between knowing what to do and what not to do. There's a link between stillness and knowing and specifically knowing what to ignore. Knowing what to ignore. Think about that for a minute. You know, we are <laughs> not only in the age of technology, we're in the age of, of information and we are bombarded in all sides all the time, almost 24 seven. Hopefully many of us can turn it off while we're sleeping. But I do know people that sleep with a TV on or whatever. And I just think, oh, please don't do that. But it takes what it takes. So you think of all the things that grab your attention, you're, you're tooling along, you've got your own day planned, something grabs your attention, grabs you as as an obligation. Those are always my faves. Um, grabs you as something that pulls you from what it is that you want to be doing. You get hooked 
We all get hooked so easily. We get hooked by the drama in our families. Maybe you don't have that kind of family. I do. I have girls, daughters. Mm, yeah. We get hooked by what's going on in our communities and in our world. And a big part of cultivating stillness is knowing that not everything needs our personal attention. Learning what to ignore. That's really vitally important. Those of you that know me know I'm a sports enthusiast. Most of you also know that I have to watch particularly football games alone because I'm such an enthusiastic fan. My husband often goes upstairs. The dogs have learned that mommy's yelling has nothing to do with them, which is a good thing, which is a good thing. Recently, we had the uh, World Series baseball. And, <clears throat> and of course, I'm right in there. Yeah. So I learned some things that I didn't know before. And one of them I learned from this um, sports psychologist. His name is Jonathan Cater. And what he said is that when these guys are rookies, they are taught to swing at every pitch swing as hard as they can at every pitch. And they kind of build a reputation on swinging and hitting. And that's a big part of what moves them up into the majors. However, when they get to the majors, it's a whole different ball game, so to speak. What happens is that now you're no longer in, invited or required to be aggressive at bat. In fact, that's kind of frowned on. Now you have to take your time. You have to be discerning about what you really think you can hit. So this is very problematic. These, these young men have built their whole identity, their whole sense of self on, on being aggressive at the plate and, and swinging and hitting all kinds of stuff. Well, get to the big league and it's, it's a different thing. You learn what to ignore. You learn what to let go by. And I think that is such an important lesson for me because I tend to get hooked into all kinds of stuff that isn't even in my lane. I, I get excited about something and I just jump in. It has nothing to do with me. Nothing I can do or say is going to improve or make anything better. And yet I do it. So I'm learning to be a little more um, discerning in what I let in and what I let go. I'm learning over many years not to get hooked by stuff and that there's some stuff to ignore. So... Mark and I have been married for 39 years. We're still working to see if it's going to work out okay, but we're trying. We're, we're trying at it. But, but here's the thing. Some of the same issues that were there in the very beginning that were, were hard for me, they're still there. The difference is I have learned how important is it? Are these things that are going to make a difference in my day? Are they going to make a difference in, in, in our future? And you know what? I'm so pleased to know that 98% of the time they don't. So I can just kind of let them go by. Um, I, had, I saw this really great line. Uh, it was in one of those little picture cartoons. It said, we should be more like Teflon and less like Velcro. More like Teflon, everything slides off, and less like Velcro that hangs on to everything. So Ryan in his book says, ask yourself this, when you're feeling bombarded, ask yourself, do I really need this? Do I really want this? Ask yourself, if I say yes to this, what are the hidden costs? Now that's the line that has helped me discern how much I need to grab onto somebody else's business or some other issue. What are the hidden costs to me? Those hidden costs to me are the things that cause me to allow my stillness to slip away. Ask yourself if the future you 
looking back will be happy that you said yes? Or will the future you looking back be unhappy that you grabbed onto that and said yes? So see, there is a real link between developing inner stillness, developing that spiritual maturity and wisdom, and knowing what to grab on to and what to let go, what to release, what to say no to. And I like the idea of not grabbing onto it in the first place. I don't know about you, but it's harder for me to release something that I've taken hold of than it is to just be the Teflon and let it slide past me. That's just me. The second idea is practicing contentment, practicing the idea of enough, practicing the idea of enough. I was talking with my oldest and wisest, my son, on the way home from, from work last week, and, and we were talking about the idea of contentment. And I can remember one of my daughters, well, they're all dramatic, so I can't say which one it was, but one of my daughters saying to me, now, now she's married out of the house. Mommy, life is so dull and boring. And I went, what? And she said, it's just really boring. And I said, you know, I'm really inviting you to step into the idea of contentment. Um, my kids grew up in an alcoholic household with a rageaholic. And, you know, if you've lived in that state of adrenaline rush or, or the, uh, of the adrenaline running your life, it's really hard to live just a normal, quiet life. So I tried explaining that to her and talking to her. And she said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll think about that. I'll try that. Thank God she's aged a bit and gotten better at it. But think about the word enough. Just think about that word for a minute. Just think about, okay, so we have a bake sale and there's fabulous things out there. No, no. Um, <laughs> we're having a bake sale and there are beautiful things out there to, to entice you. And so think about enough. So you're having a meal with friends and you're having a pleasant conversation and everything is peachy and you feel totally satisfied. The meal has satisfied you. You've had a satisfying conversation. You have the warm glow. You feel good. That's enough. Okay. Um, you know what happens to us health-wise when we keep going, we keep eating. Uh, I grew up in a house where food is love. And um, not only are, is food forced on you practically, but you better eat it all. So for me, I've had a problem my whole life with leaving food on my plate. And I'll think, well, gosh, I really can't save two bites. I guess I'll just eat it. And then I don't feel good. I feel terrible. So, you know, we have Thanksgiving coming. Yay. And it's, um, does anybody know who's playing what, what games are on Thanksgiving? This is important. We have to plan what time we're going to eat. <laughs> You're laughing, but I'm serious. Because, you know, there's football field, there's food, there's game food, and there's Thanksgiving feasting food, right? Football food is different. Football food is hot dogs, it's popcorn, it's chips, it's dips and beer. And, you know, you have to eat football food because you know that if you don't, your team is not going to succeed. I mean, a loyal fan eats up because they burn a lot of energy. The team does, not necessarily you, except I do, I guess. But anyway, so in my, my family growing up, we had football food, then we had Thanksgiving dinner. And everybody ate football food and Thanksgiving dinner. And, and, you know, if you're really a good guest, you will eat a second helping. At least try everything because God help you if you ignore some lovely person who brought a dish to share and you don't eat any of it. So, you know, you eat up. And what happens? We all get that turkey trance, right? where you just, you're full and you feel sleepy. In fact, you're so full, you wish your jeans had elastic or at least you could undo your belt. Yeah. So the idea of enough is really, while I'm talking about quantities of food, it's really never about a quantity. The idea of enough is a state of consciousness. 
And if we get into that idea of enough of being about a quantity, you find that you're never going to be satisfied. You're always going to think, well, if I just get this one more thing, or if I just earn this, or if I just do that, and that's really not what it is. I can't stress that enough. The idea of enough is about sufficiency. And there's a different, definite correlation between the idea of sufficiency and I'm going to make the word up enoughness, enoughness, the state of enough, enough. It's about a state of awareness. And if you think it's tied to quantity, you're missing the boat. I've been talking about quantity, but I'm really talking about a state of consciousness. In Ryan's book, he, he uh, tells a little story, and I've actually used it as an illustration before, about two famous authors. Um, Joseph Heller, who was the author of Catch-22. Some of you are too young to know these books. Um, and his, his good friend, Kurt Vonnegut, who wrote um, Slaughterhouse-Five, or did he get it backwards? Slaught, Slaught, Slaughterhouse-Five is Joseph Heller, and Catch-22 is Kurt Vonnegut. No, I had it right the first time? Okay, I am blonde. Okay, so anyways, they're at this party in a very upscale neighborhood of New York at the second palatial estate of some kind of boring billionaire. And they're out on the terrace kind of talking and, and um, Vonnegut turns to his friend Joe and he's kind of just needling him a little bit. And he goes, so how does it feel to know that your host made more money yesterday than you've made for the whole length of time that your novel has been out? How, how, how do you feel about that? I mean, the book has history, right? But how do you feel about that? And Heller says, well, I've got something he'll never have. And Kurt Vonnegut says, well, well what is it? And he says, I have the knowledge that I have enough. The knowledge that I have enough. And I bet you if we asked ourselves, sitting right where you are today, and you don't have to raise your hand or nod or anything, but if you ask yourself, I think you would say, well, I have enough. I have enough. Maybe you don't have the lotus, latest fashion or, or you don't have the, um, the steak on your plate for, for lunch that you might want. But to say, I have enough, that's huge. That's huge. So cultivating stillness is about cultivating a quality, a, a state of mind. And another part of that cultivating stillness is about cultivating solitude. Now, you know, you remember a, a year ago when we were on shutdown, uh, we were called, it was called um, shelter in place, such a lovely term. Um, in a sense, there's a lot of people who are still living shelter in place. And my hope is that for, for all of us, that we harvested something out of that time besides feeling separate and alone. And one of the things I'm hoping is that you remember that you're never alone, that God is with you, was with you, will always be with you. Now, when you're in the midst of stuff, sometimes we forget, right? Until we get to that point when we're on our knees and we're yelling, God, help me. And God's always there. You just have to turn to God. And there are some jewels of the solitude. And one of them is having quiet, quiet alone time. So the third point is the definite link between spiritual peace, spiritual stillness, and seeking solitude. Now, we are social creatures by nature. We are social creatures that enjoy and need interaction with others, some of us more than others. But you have to go back and think about Jesus in his teaching. You, you, you remember the number of times he was in a crowd and he separated himself and he went aside. We used to say he went apart so he wouldn't fall apart. He went aside. We think he was praying. What we do know is that he was gathering himself, regenerating his energy. 
his spiritual mastery. And you only do that when you're alone. And it's so important because in groups of people, our energy gets dissipated. That's just the way it is. It gets dif- dissipated. And if we're never alone, if we don't take time to be with ourselves, it's really hard to understand ourselves if we're never by ourselves. I know a number of people who are very committed to doing things and they are just scheduling do, 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 do morning till night every day. And I think to myself, now, granted, I didn't always think this way, but I do now. And that is, how do they do that? When do they have time alone? When do they have space to be alone? And it's really, really important. And I wonder sometimes, because I've been that way in the past, maybe I was reluctant to be alone because I was afraid of something I might discover about myself that I might not like. So the truth is we have to become willing to be face to face with just ourselves so that we can understand ourselves, so we can truly appreciate ourselves and so that we can love others and allow them to love us the way we want. But that doesn't happen if we don't know who we are. And I think it's important that sometimes we have to disconnect so that we can better connect. You get what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to go apart from others so that when you come together, you have carried with you some of those gifts of stillness so that you're better able to cope, better able to meet whatever is needed in a calm way. I came across this this quote that was surprising to me, the source of it, James Mattis, who's the four-star Marine Corps general. He was the former Secretary of State. And his comment on the importance of solitude and the function it plays. Mattis says, if I was to sum up the single biggest problem with senior leadership in the information age, it is the lack of reflection. Solitude allows you to reflect while others are reacting. We need solitude to refocus our perspective on decision-making. And rather than just reacting to problems as they arise. I think that's so important. And I love that it was he who said that. There's a weight to it that may not be there from, for many people if they heard it from someone else. They don't hear it as well from a scholar as they do from from a military peer. Some some time ago, I don't think it was even in this year, um, I was watching um, a documentary on uh, Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft. And in this particular documentary, he was talking about the importance for him of, of having solitude and that for many, many years, He takes at least twice a year, goes to a cabin in the woods that is very secluded, where he can be in solitude for a couple of weeks. And it gives him time to think and to read, to be alone and to to contemplate things. And after I watched that, I thought, gee, I wonder how many of his great ideas and his innovations come out of that that time that he has alone. Um, I I think of all the good things that his foundations have done for our world. And yet he knows that he needs that time without mechanical noise, without media. He needs that that, um, practice of disconnecting, of giving himself time and space. Now, I know there are people in this room who will say, well, that's just not, yes, Is through is through that, which is what I wondered, but he never credited that. But yeah. Okay, Jan was saying that um, she read or heard that 
the, um, the, in, the inspiration for many of the things that he's done have come out of those times of quiet contemplation. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, it really does. So I know that there are people sitting here and say, well, that's just not practical. I'm a mom with, with kids. I can't just go off for two weeks. Well, how many of us can? We, we can't necessarily take two weeks in the woods. Lovely idea. But we can take two minutes to be totally silent and quiet. We have people that say, I can't take time off. I have to work two jobs just to make ends meet. I get that. I've been there. But what I do know is if it is your intention to experience peace of mind and peace of heart, if it is your intention to function in your world from a state of calm wisdom, then you need to set the intention to take time in the silence. Now, with a as a mom with young kids, which I was at one time, um, I found an another mom or two to trade time with. And here's the thing, it takes discipline. Because when your kids aren't there, you think, aha, now I'm going to do the grocery shopping. And moms with small children know that grocery shopping with kids is not your favorite fun thing. Um, and now you're so blessed that you can have things delivered. Oh my gosh. But nevertheless, you think of all the things you can do without the children there, but that's not the point. The point of the time is to be quiet, to spend the time in prayer and meditation in solitude. And if inspirational reading helps you get there, great. If music helps you get there, great. But whatever it takes, needing to come into that place of stillness. It's as vitally important as your daily dose of vitamins or whatever supplements you may take. It's, it's, it's more important than that even. So finding someone to trade time with is, is a great boon when you, have, when you have kids and you can't take a break. Because I remember as a mom, you can't even use the bathroom without someone in the room or knocking at the door, or crying because you're out of sight. I remember those days. That's why you have kids when you're young. Yeah. The fourth point is there is a definite link between cultivating stillness and having some sort of routine. Having a routine. You know, I didn't see a lot of people during the shutdown, as you can imagine, but I talked to a lot of people every single day. And one of the biggest challenges that people shared was that their routine, their way of life, their way of living that worked for them pre-shutdown was gone because they were now having to monitor their kids' schooling because the kids were schooling online. They were trying to work from home with children home. Um, the whole idea of, of the routine that helps us stay focused and do what is ours to do, when it's gone, it's tough, it's tough. So if you feel out of balance, and we're past being locked down, but if you feel out of balance, take a minute, step back and say, well, well wait a minute, have I lost my routine? Have I, have I forgotten what kept me in rhythm and balance? And when those things are gone, yeah, it, it affects everything. So when you're out of balance, when you're out of routine, everything feels more difficult versus when your life is in balance. We find it easier to have peace of mind and stillness when we have our routine. So you gotta go back to basics and, 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 and find, find a way to incorporate or create a new routine with some consistency. Because when you have that, you can relax into everything else. I saw this quote and I thought it was so perfect. When the body is busy with the familiar, the mind can relax. When the body is busy with the familiar, the mind can relax. And the last thing that I would offer up to cultivate stillness is a reminder. And it is to remember that we have a connection with each other. We are all part of this great web of life. We are truly connected. And I love that our spiritual practice has the name unity in it. 
We are one, but we're not the same. We come from different backgrounds. We've had different experiences. We have different hopes and dreams. And yet beneath all that, at the very core of our being is oneness. We are the same. We have this shared human heart. We cry over the same kinds of things. We grieve over the same things. We hope, we dream in so many of the same ways. And that part of what happens when we grow and mature spiritually is that this idea of connectedness, our oneness becomes a reality that is so much stronger than it was before. It becomes so vitally important to us. It's where we put our time and energy and where we put our talents, what we stand for, what we advocate for. Many, many years ago uh, at the church I served on Diamond Head, the astronaut Edgar Mitchell came and shared what he shared all over the country, I'm sure, about his experiences when he walked on the moon. And I think it was 1971 when he did that. Um, he said that he had an instant global consciousness and a people orientation and, an, and that he found an, that he had an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world and a compulsion to do something about it. A compulsion to do something about it. He said, all the squabbles, all the stuff going on seems so insignificant in comparison to the reality of the truth. The spaceship we call Earth calls our connection with each other to be the highest calling. And maybe that sounds a little Poly Pollyanna-ish, but I know in my heart of hearts that when we live with that kind of belief that we are one and we are connected, it is so much better than any alternative. I know when we live with the kind of belief, the choices that we make in our day-to-day -day life do not just end up with us, do not just impact us, but touch the entire population. And when we live from that realization, we will be about transforming our world, will about, be about doing it with love. So I invite you to take this concept of stillness into your mind and heart, and maybe just the word itself, pray on that, think on that over the next several days. And maybe some of the practices I've shared will be meaningful to you, and maybe you'll find your own some different ones. But what I want you to do is begin to practice and practice more deeply this whole idea of the inner stillness, the inner calm, because I want you to be the shiniest, brightest example of who you are, who God created you to be as a spiritually conscious person living in this human experience. I wish you the very best in this week as you travel inward in your spiritual journey. And I look forward to connecting with you next Sunday. Namaste. So let's prepare for a time of meditation. And you've been sitting still. You may need to wiggle and move a little bit so you can get comfortable. And as you do so, we turn within to that quiet place that we know so well. This is the meeting place with God. It's about having an attitude of gratitude gratitude attitude. Reverend John Ramsey tells how in one church a certain person provided him with a rose boutonniere for his lapel every Sunday. Every single Sunday he had a new flower in his lapel. And at first he was truly grateful and then it sort of became routine and then one Sunday became very special. As he was leaving after the Sunday service, a young boy walked up to him and said, Sir, what are you going to do with your flower? At first, the preacher didn't know what the boy was talking about. And when it sank in, he pointed to the rose on his lapel and said, You mean this? And the little boy said, Yes, sir. If you're just going to throw away... I'd like to have it. 
And the preacher smiled and told him he could have the flower and then casually said, what you going to do with it? And the boy who was very young said, he looked up at the preacher and he said, sir, I'm going to give it to my granny. My mother and father divorced last year and I was living with my mother, but she married again and wanted me to live with my father. And I lived with him for a while, but then he said I couldn't stay. So he sent me to live with my grandmother. She is so good to me. She cooks for me. She takes care of me. She's been so good to me. And I wanted to give her that pretty flower for loving me. When the little boy finished, the preacher could hardly speak. His eyes filled with tears and he felt like he'd been touched by God. He reached up and unpinned the rose. And with the flower in his hand, he looked at the boy and said, son, that's the nicest thing I've ever heard. But you can't have this flower because it's not enough. If you look in front of the pulpit, you'll see a big bouquet of flowers. Different families buy them for the church each week. Please take those flowers to your granny because she deserves the very best. And then the little boy made one last statement, which Reverend Ramsey said he will always treasure. The boy said, what a wonderful day. I asked for one flower, but I got a whole bouquet. That's the thankful spirit. That's the gratitude attitude. And it's that attitude that should guide our giving and our lives. Like that boy's granny. God has blessed us so much. God has been so good to us that giving shouldn't even be a question. It should just flow from us naturally. So in this time of silence, reflect on the things that you may have taken for granted. Reflect on the goodness of people, not just those you know, the ones you can call by name, but the others that you see doing good and great things around you. Let each of those people be one little candle of light in your heart as you rest in the silence. Thank you, God, for loving us so much, for giving us so much in every way and every day, for the opportunities to grow, 
to flow with love and kindness, to live our lives from that quiet space of calm assurance, to be that unhurried person in the midst of any crisis, to stand in our truth, even at those times when we stand alone. And to know that despite what we often see, what we don't agree with, that you are at work in every situation and that ultimately everything is working together for good. For this truth and our ever greater realization of it, we say thank you, thank you God. And so it is. Amen. This is the time in our celebration when we prepare to give our gifts. And I want to share with you that we may be an intimate gathering here today, but in truth, we are many. That there are many, many people around the world who may not be officially unitics or members of a unity community, but who share our viewpoints, who share our ways of thinking and being, and being loving to one another. And so as we prepare to give our gifts, do it with the realization that while I may not always be here, we are in the process of calling a new minister. Don't think you don't need to give because you're not paying a salary because you are. You're giving towards the new minister coming. And that's really, really important. So I invite you to hold the gift that you wish to give and hold it in your hands and really speak from the heart as you say this. There is no lack or limitation. I give and freely I receive from God's abundance. I am blessed as I give and unity is blessed in receiving. Thank you, God. We have a thanks song that uh, echoing is invited. Everybody's got masks on, so we're good with that. And Doug, uh, Doug just let me suggested this song a few days ago, and I thought yeah, this is perfect. I also want to say I think right after it's real short, we'll give a little um, flavor of the song that we're gonna sing at the end, a, a new song for all of us, and um, so we'll. Pat, take a pass on that. I mean, pass through that, and then we'll do it again before we sing it together. So here's the one that's called We Give Thanks. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day, all gathered here, those far away. For this time we share with love and care. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day. So if there's a little space for you if you want to echo after me so you don't have to have the words memorized or anything. There we go. Oh, we give thanks, we give thanks for this precious day, for this precious day. All gathered here, and those far away, those far away, for this time we share, this time we share with love and care. Oh, we give thanks for this precious day. I'm going to slow it down just a little bit and do it one more time. Oh, we give thanks, oh, we give thanks for this precious day. All gathered here, those far away, for this time we share, with love and care. Oh, we give thanks 
for this precious day. Good job. And I think that would be a nice one to maybe do a little bit regular, regularly. Here's one that uh, we're going to be singing right before we sing the peace song. And, you know, I've been, I walked into a unity uh, in 1989, but I've never sung this song. <laughs> I know. So we learned a new one. Thanks, Doug, for helping learn. This is in the Unity uh, hymnal and, and uh, called Unity. So we're going to just give you the flavor of it so that it won't be quite as tricky um, when we come to trying to sing it. So and you're going to play the melody and I'm going to sing the melody maybe yes. or, or just, and you know what? I won't, I won't even sing the words yet. I'll just get that melody in your head and you can try to get that. Okay. on the screen before the end of service. Okay. Do you have more to do with Kevin's gonna Oh, Kevin's going to do it. Okay. Well, we're going to bless the offering, but you're going to give me talk about the book. Oh. Hello. <laughs> am I still on here? Yeah, I am. Okay, so... Um, we met with the roof company this week, and uh, we have decided that it's time we have to replace the roof. And just one second. While he's doing that, I'm going to bless the offering. While Kevin's getting his props, we're going to bless the offering. Can we do that? We can. We can bless the offering. Yeah, we sure can. So thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to give of our good. We send this gift forward to do your will and your work that we may co-create a consciousness of heaven and peace here and now. And so it is. Amen. Okay. I just have some effects here to show you that um, the roof is really beyond um, patching at this point. It really does need a replacement. Um, there's so many seams that are just completely uh, broken open and so many cracks in the rubber after 50 years that um, right now we're really in danger of having the, uh, the, the actual materials that are below the roof to just start to rot out. And if you look around here, you'll see places where we've had leaks and a lot of these, there's a lot of new tiles in here that just hide the fact that we've had leaks before. But it's time to do it. Um, right now, we feel like we have about two thirds of the money to pay for the roof. And we have a finance plan to basically pay the rest off in a maximum of three years. And I just uh, want to speak to you to, to realize that if you want the center to still be here and you want the center to be in, in sturdy shape, that uh, just continue to give towards that cause because um, it will take a few years to pay off the balance, but I'm sure that we're going to do it or we would not be going through with the plan. And if you have any questions at all, um, take a look at the pictures and, uh, and also um, see me after church, if, if that's okay. Thanks. Okay, so we're 
we're going to get ready to sing our new song. And it's not a new song. I, I know that Russ and Lynn were probably singing the words with me. We used to call it the unity fight song because it's U-N-I-T-Y. You know, like you're doing your at a game. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I do. I do. It is why I love it. So anyway, quickly before we do our song, um, Life Journey Groove meets second and fourth Monday nights from 6.30 to about 8.30. Cindy Whedon is facilitating. Um, we have a new new book coming up. Uh, this book we're, we're, we're pal with, we're, we're done with. But the new book coming up is The Art of Aging um, from Roll to Soul. And it's by Connie Zwig. And it will begin the first Thursday of December, which is December the 2nd. We have, so we have a little break for people to get the book. Okay, following that, that's at 9.30. Following that, um, actually 9.15. Following that on, on Thursdays at 11 o'clock is the Silent Unity Prayer Service. And it's, we pray at that time because we're praying in unison with people all around the world that are coordinating with Silent Unity at World Headquarters. Midweek meditations continue. You can tune in uh, to the Facebook page or to the um, website and um, join us for meditation. If you can't take the time to do a full meditation, at least give yourself the gift of a couple of minutes at 12 noon every day to just be still. If you, if you don't think I can get into the silence in two minutes, fine. Use that time to bless yourself, your family, our community, and of course, our state and our world, yes. The Course in Miracles is every Sunday at 1145 in the Fireside Room. It's facilitated by Joanne Burnell. I, I, I'm sorry, jo, I said Burnell and I didn't mean that. <laughs> Joanne Bauman, I apologize. Uh, Joanne Bauman, um, next Sunday is the last Sunday of the month. So it's Friendship and Potluck Sunday bring something to share and bring a friend and introduce them to us. We're not so weird and strange. Um, so, so to do that, and when there's food involved, people loosen up a little bit. And today is the annual bake sale. Please take time to um, peruse the offerings that are out there. And I know you won't go hand, home empty handed or uh, in any way, not, not enjoying the good that has come to you. Okay, thank you. You can put stuff in your freezer too for later. Uh, one more announcement. Okay. So you need to get away. <laughs> All right. That is exactly that. Yes. <clears throat> I have a special proclamation to read here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unity Center in Milwaukee, official proclamation. Whereas Reverend Mary Gabrielson will end her service at Unity in Milwaukee in December of 2021. And whereas Reverend Mary Gabrielson began her head ministry position at Unity Center in Milwaukee in March, 2015. And whereas she served Unity Center in Milwaukee in the capacity of assistant minister for over one year before that time. And whereas Reverend Mary Gabrielson has successfully guided the Unity Center in Milwaukee through financial hardships and challenges, and whereas she has enabled Unity Center in Milwaukee to be an invaluable member of the greater community through efforts such as the annual Mitten Tree, support of the Hunger Task Force, the World Day of Prayer, Minister's Weekly Book Discussion Groups, Life Journey Groups, Meditation Groups, and has provided meeting space for other community groups, and whereas Reverend Mary Gabrielson has continued the tradition of Unity Center in Milwaukee, as a progressive, welcoming center for people of all races, genders, and beliefs. And whereas Reverend Mary Gabrielson has supported and assisted the spiritual growth of so many people during her time here, and whereas she has tirelessly supported her flock, and whereas Reverend Mary Gabrielson will be sorely missed, now, therefore, I, Kevin Rieger, as president of the Board of Trustees, and with the unanimous support of the entire board of trustees do proclaim the remainder of 2021 to be Reverend Mary Gabrielson appreciation time. <laughs> and I urge all members of the community to celebrate this time by expressing their gratitude and appreciation to Reverend Mary Gabrielson 
for all she has meant to them and to the Unity Center in Milwaukee. Hereby proclaim this 21st day of November, 2021. And here is a box and here are appreciation cards. So if you feel so moved, please fill out a card and drop it in this box and we'll have this out there in the other room. And uh, this will be a going away gift to Reverend Mary when she finally leaves. So um, write out your notes as, as soon as you feel moved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I, I, it had just the uh, effect on her that I wanted. <laughs> I'm so glad that, that you're touched. <laughs> We're all touched. All right. Okay. And we have the lyrics to this special request by Reverend Mary and the, the fight song for unity. And we're going to, before you circle up, let's do it once through with the venerable Tuba. <laughs> so that'll get you in the mood. So we're gonna run it through and, and just follow the lyrics um, once on through all the lyrics and then we'll get up and we'll do it once again, okay? So we can have it with confidence. Yeah. We follow Christ the unity way, the way of study and prayer. When help we need to him, we turn and find him always there. U-N-I-T-Y, unity. We love the truth that makes us free. We broadcast a message of truth, light and love. We live with God in unity. We glory in our unity, growth in body, spirit, and soul. To see the Christ in everyone that makes us well and whole. You and I, T, Y, unity. We love the truth that makes us free. We broadcast a message of truth, light, and love. We live with God in unity. First, can we give him a hand? <laughs> I might not have every single note on that one, but I'm doing my best. You sound great. So this is a circle up time. Yeah. And then we'll do it again and we'll go right into the peace song that actually you're gonna play from there. Yeah. So we're gonna make our circle. There are monitors that we can all see from our circle. And we're gonna sing you into the dust. <laughs> <laughs> If you're not comfortable holding hands, put your hand on the shoulder of the person around you. <laughs> We've all heard about Mark. Then you jump in. Okay. This is the intro. Here we go. We follow Christ, the unity way, the way of study and prayer. When help we need for him, we turn and find him always there. Spell it. U-N-I-T-Y, unity. We love the truth that makes us free. We broadcast a message of truth, light, and love. We live with God in unity. We glory in our unity, growth in body, spirit, and soul. To see the Christ in everyone that makes us well and all. U-N-I-T-Y, unity. We love the truth that makes us free. We broadcast a message of truth, light, and love. 
We live with God in unity. Thank <laughs> you. 